Hi, I'm Casey Bell, and you're watching Writer to Writer Interviews. We are back, and it's time for more conversation. Let's get into it. Well, that is all the time we have today for today's episode, Writer Writer Interviews. I am your host, Casey Bell. Please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we hope to see you again next week for another episode of Writer to Writer Interviews. Blaine Radas travels and adventures started early. Between kindergarten and high school, he lived in eight places and attended eight different schools and spent three years at a free school, which encouraged independent learning, where Blaine focused on art, math, and playing in the mud. As a member of the National Speaker Association, Blaine has achieved the highest earned destination certified speaking professional. Blaine has spent over 30 years in the financial services industry and travels the country helping companies grow their businesses and stand out from the competition. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Blaine Rada. What is exactly Camino de Santiago? So the Camino de Santiago is a pilgrimage, which was a word that I had to actually find out what that really meant because I didn't grow up with any specific religious upbringing. So of course I had heard of the word pilgrimage, but I didn't really understand what it was. Um, but technically it's a pilgrimage across Northern Spain that has been walked for over a thousand years um, by millions of people, literally. Um, and it, 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 the reason that, that it exists is that at the end of the journey in the town of Santiago, Spain is a cathedral. And in that cathedral are the remains of the Apostle St. James. And so that's what people have been making a pilgrimage to for, like I said, over a thousand years. Wow. Um, why did you choose to take this walk? So I first learned of it probably about 10 years ago. There was a movie that came out called The Way, starring Martin Sheen. And much of the movie was about this journey that he and people that he met along the way were taking. Um, and it just sounded like one of those things when I first heard about it. I don't know if you've had this experience, Casey, but in my life, there's been a handful of times when I either hear about something or I learn something or I see something. And I just kind of say to myself at that time, I think I'm going to do that someday. You know, I think that's a thing that, you know, whether you call it on your bucket list or however you describe those lists of things that you want to get to someday. It was just something that I felt compelled to do when the timing was right. And so I didn't really think anything more about it after I had seen that movie and kind of got interested in the journey, um, knowing that the timing then wasn't right. And so I just kind of, you know, didn't think about it for a long time. And then it kind of came back into my mind several years later. Um, and, I, you know, I, I guess I didn't even really think much about why I was going until it got really close. I mean, I had to, I had to make these arrangements a year in advance. Um, you know, I had to look out into my calendar. And of course, this is, you know, pre pandemic. So, you know, thinking back to what our lives were like before, I had to look in my calendar and try to find where's a big chunk of time that I could literally just disconnect from my entire life and and have enough time to do this because most of the experts that write books about this journey said that you should take at least a month you know 35 40 days is what you kind of need which is a long time to be away from work and family and all of our normal responsibilities so when i eventually made that commitment and and kind of booked everything a year in advance and decided okay i'm going to do this thing i didn't really think anything more about it until it started to get close and then I really started to dwell on, well, why am I even doing this? And of course, everybody around me was asking, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know? um, why would you walk 500 miles? You know, it just seems like kind of an odd thing for someone to do. Um, and I didn't have like a specific reason other than I just, I wanted it to be a transformative experience. I wanted to come back a better version of myself. Right. So whatever that means, you know, better husband, better father, better coworker. Um, I mean, I could make a list. I could make a list of all the things that I wish I could change or or be better at. But I didn't really have a list. I just wanted it to be this transformational experience. I was open to whatever happened. 
and was hoping that in whatever way possible, it would make me better. That was really my, my why. So this is question number 2.5. Um, so you have to, I'm assuming now that you're telling me this, you have to, I'm assuming you have to set up hotels along the way. Like how does this journey work? Like I'm yeah, so there's, there's as, as many ways to do it as there are people that do it. So, okay. um, I tend to my, my way, uh, and, and actually doing things that are very physically challenging have been kind of a lifelong thing of mine. So, um, you know, running marathons or doing triathlons or, uh, you know, uh, spending time in nature with, you know, no provisions. I mean, do, doing things that are like physically challenging have always been my way of learning more about myself. So I chose to kind of do this as traditionally as possible. And so what that meant was um, I didn't really have reservations um, except for a handful of times. There there are some larger cities that you pass through and I wanted to take those opportunities in the larger cities to actually stay at a hotel where I could, you know, get a decent shower or bath and, and have a nice meal and do some laundry in town and just kind of, you know, and not have to rough it so much. But most of the time you're staying in hostels and these hostels, I mean, they're every kind of hostel imaginable from no running water, no electricity to, you feel like you're in someone's living room. You know, they, they're really everything in between. And I chose not to make reservations because I didn't want to have to be confined to a certain amount of distance each day. I knew how much I had to walk to finish in the number of days I had, but I didn't want each day to be kind of a prescription of, oh, I've, I've got to get to this spot or I get to that spot and I still want to walk and I can't because this is where my reservation is. So I chose to just trust that there would be room and and there were times when there weren't there wasn't i mean there were towns that i had reached that that i was planning to stay and there was no place to stay and i had to keep walking to the next town um but other people make reservations for the entire thing and and many people don't even stay in hostels at all they stay in in more you know hotels or bed and breakfasts or you know nicer accommodations in fact some people um don't have to carry and maybe they can't carry their pack. So I had a backpack of about 25 pounds on me. Um, for people who didn't want to do that or maybe couldn't, there are services where they will pick up your, your backpack in the morning and take it to where you're headed to that day. And so all you have to do is take with you whatever you might need for the day. And so there's just a lot of different ways that people can go about making the journey. But I, I chose, you know, kind of the more traditional, you know, rough, rough it way just because that's, that's my way. <laughs> that's, that's how I do things. So after you went through all of this, what, where did the idea come from to turn it into a book, to share your experience? Yeah, so I, I really didn't have that as a plan. I think like a lot of people, I've, I've been intrigued by the idea of writing a book. You know, if you ask most people, I think, I think many would say, oh yeah, I've got a book in me, or there's something I'd like to be able to, you know, put on paper for posterity or, um, and I just never, like most people, did anything with those ideas. Just it was like a some yeah someday someday I'll I'll write a book. And I didn't even know what it would be about. Would it be about my professional life or the business I've been in? Or yeah, so I, I wasn't thinking about writing a book about the Camino. Um, most of my work is speaking, uh, speaking at conferences and events. And so I'm used to giving presentations. And one of the things that I was thinking about during my experience was of all these things that I'm learning and experiencing, what are the stories and the lessons and things that I could put into my speeches, you know, that I could put into my work. Still really wasn't thinking about it being a book. So when I came home, um, I had every intention of basically writing a summary of my experience. So, you know, I've done a lot of traveling and I've often at the end of my travels, you know, written kind of a, a summary of what happened and where did I go? Because family and friends and coworkers might be interested in knowing and it's just easier to give them something in writing than to you know, have to tell the story a thousand times. And so I gathered all the things that I had, I had um, collected in terms of what had happened. So what I did during the journey was uh, 
I took short little videos every at the end of every day. So I basically did a self, selfie video at the end of every day, just capturing my thoughts and how I was doing and what was on my mind and how was I feeling and what struggles was I having and just because I knew I'd forget. Um, and then I made little notes. I didn't even journal. I didn't have time. So I just made little bullet points of, you know, went here, did this, saw, saw this. And I started putting all that together when I came back. Um, and as I was writing, it just became this enormous project and you know i i get to about 30,000 words and realize this isn't just like a summary of my trip this is actually a story this is actually a journey and i think there are things in it that people um you know would would find interesting or helpful or useful and so i decided to use that experience as to kind of get myself into experiencing what it was like to put a book out there and so I, you know, I went through all the various, uh, you know, challenges and questions around how, how do I publish and, and what resources do I use and how much do I do myself versus have other people do and all those things that a first time author struggles with and just trying to figure out how to put a book into the world. Because um, there's so many choices now, right? It's, it's, it's so many ways that a person can, can create a book. Um, and I wanted to go through that experience. I wanted it to be something that I would learn from. And so I just decided I would, I would use that experience because I had enough information and enough of a story to tell to create my first book. And, um, and I couldn't be happier. I mean, it, 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 was a, it was in and of itself, it was a whole nother journey. Um, I know it's difficult, but just one thing that sparks your memory that you got from this walk as far as one thing you learned about yourself that you didn't know beforehand or something that made you see something differently um, in life, just of all the things you remember, what was the one thing that you yeah. remember? So it, it, there, it, it, there is one thing that I can point to. Um, it's, it's, it's not probably as specific as, as some people would like it to be, but um, one of the things that happened to me during the walk was that I felt as if my heart was opening. And I don't really have a better way to describe it other than that I was feeling feelings and emotions and even the thoughts I was having about things were at such a deeper level than, than is typical for me. You know, I'm not a very emotive person, for instance. You know, I have adult children who could probably count on one hand the number of times that they've witnessed me crying. And yet I cried every day on the Camino. Um, and it wasn't always sadness. You know, sometimes it was joy. Sometimes it was, you know, a beautiful sunrise. I mean, there were all kinds of reasons, but the emotions and the feelings um, and even, you know, even simple ideas like realizing how much we need each other. I mean, that's a, that's a very simple concept that most people intellectually understand. Yeah, yeah, we're all connected. We all need each other. You know, I get that the way in which I was actually like understanding that idea about needing each other was so much more intense during that experience. And I think part of it is, you know, you're, you're just literally getting stripped to the, to the bone, to the essence of who you are out there. You know, I was walking nine hours a day. I was walking 20 miles a day. Um, many times I was alone for hours or had very little interaction, you know, with people. And so there's a tremendous amount of kind of just stripping away of, you know, all the things that normally define who I am and all the things that I spend my time and energy thinking about and doing in my normal life. Those were all gone. Um, I just walked, you know, I got up in the morning, I walked, eventually I stopped. And the next day I repeated, and that's a pretty simple existence. And when we kind of strip away all that other stuff that's normally part of our life and just focus on something so simple as just walking every day, um, it kind of opens you up in a different way. So of course the challenge in feeling like my heart had opened up and that I was really kind of experiencing feelings and emotions at a, at a deeper level, the challenge was how do I do that when I get back home? How, how, do, I, how do I be that same open-hearted person when I get back into the daily grind of emails and meetings and, and, and honestly, it is a challenge. I mean, I, I can, I'm different. Um, 
I still cry a lot more now than I ever used to, you know, I, I used to, I used to look at my wife, you know, and we'd be watching something on television and there'd be a commercial and then it would bring her to tears. And I'd think, wow, oh, she's just such a sensitive person that this commercial brought her to tears. Well, now I'm that person, you know, that's crying at these commercials. So I kind of feel like the heart has opened, has remained open. Um, but it, it is definitely harder to still have those kind of deep feelings, uh, in the razzmatazz of, of a busy life right. than it is when you're out in nature by yourself, for sure. So is there anyone you would suggest specific, cause you can say everyone should do this, but is there any type of person specifically you would suggest that um, at least consider taking this journey? Well, certainly you're right in that you know, I wouldn't ever want to discourage anyone from doing it for whatever reasons they might object or say, oh, that's not for me, or I could never do that. Um, I don't think that's true. I do think uh, to get the most from the experience, you, you probably want it to in some way be a, a spiritual journey. Um, I mean, some people might do it just because they like walking, um, some people might do it with others because they just want to spend a bunch of time. I mean, there, there were uh, two sisters that I came across from Australia and one of them still lives in Australia and the other one I think lives in the U S and they literally do this every year. They don't do the whole thing. They just take like a week or 10 days and, and walk however far they walk in that time. But they meet on the Camino once a year and the entire time they're there, they're, they're there for each other. That's their time to kind of bond as sisters, right? So that's a totally different reason. Um, ultimately, my definition of pilgrimage that worked for me was that it was a physical journey with a spiritual intention. Physical journey with a spiritual intention. So if I believe that that was kind of the definition that worked for me for what a pilgrimage is, then I guess what I'd say is that the people that that applies to um, need to be okay with the physicality of it because right. it's, it's physical, right? I mean, you can find ways to make it easier, but at the end of the day, it's a physical journey. Um, and then again, I think if there can be some type of spiritual or if people prefer the word religious, I mean, it, it, it is a Catholic tradition, you know, at its base. Um, but obviously there's lots of people out there that aren't Catholic or aren't even, uh, I mean, don't have any, any religious or spiritual practice, right? So that doesn't have to define why you're there, but I do think if you're at least open to it being a spiritual experience, you probably get a different experience than if you're just going for a long walk. Hey, are you a writer? A songwriter, a playwright, screenwriter, author, you write articles, poetry. If you're a writer, I want to sit down and talk with you. Go to my website, authorkcbell.com, and click on Writer to Writer Interviews for more information. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this message. A journey inspired by the film The Way, author Blaine Rada shares his experience walking the Camino de Santiago. From Soar Souls to a Soaring Soul is a great look into a physical journey with spiritual intentions. Available on Amazon.com. We are back and it's time for more conversation. So it was really interesting as I was kind of looking at the, the work that you've done and all the books that you've written and uh, you know, the one in particular, the four keys to success. Um, I, I guess before I even speak specifically about that one, um, one, of the, one of your book titles, and if you don't want to spend much time talking about this one, that's totally fine. But one of the book titles that you have um, really intrigued me, To College or Not to College. And it just kind of made me wonder with all of the books that you've written. And if you want to focus it on the four keys to success, that's fine. But you know, how, how is it that you come up with the ideas for a book? What inspires a particular topic and how do you, um, how do you take that idea or that, that, you know, that, um, that thought that you have, how do you turn that into a finished product? 
The college book was originally supposed to be a book about my experiences in college. Um, I spent five years only because I made a lot of mistakes. And most of those mistakes could have been prevented because they were, I didn't have information that I should have had. And I felt like if not the high school teachers, at least the college professors should have gave it to me before I made the decisions I made. So the youth at my church, I was trying to, you know, prevent them from going through the same things. And so I wasn't sure whether I should do workshop, what I should do. So I said, I'll just write a book. And originally it was only supposed to be about everything you should and shouldn't do while you're in college. And as I was writing it, I heard God said, well, not everybody needs college. Mm. So I did research on alternate education. And the good thing about it is I found out a lot of information even about college. Like I didn't realize that there were seven colleges in America that are free. You don't have to pay anything. And so I put the book together so that those who are not in college yet don't make the same mistakes I made. And I can't remember, I just remember saying, you know, either you go to college or you don't. And I don't know why I thought of Shakespeare at that moment in time, but that's oh, how okay. I came up with the title to college, not to college, to be an author. Yeah. I don't remember exactly how Shakespeare came to my mind, but actually in the beginning of the first thing you see is a poem to college, not to college, where it's kind of like the monologue to be or not to be, but it's about college instead. And so the first section is everything that I learned that I wish I would have known prior to college and some other added information. Um, even simple things like, um, cause I, I find it funny that parents, cause I went to college with some students who didn't actually want to be in college, but their parents forced them, mm -hmm. but they didn't save. And I'm like, well, if you, you want your child to go to college, the moment, you know, you're pregnant, you should start saving for the child. So I talk about saving for your child's um, college and knowing that you don't really have to pay because at the end of the year, your taxes, you can get that money back. And most people don't know that. So the first section is everything you should know about college, the th mistakes you shouldn't make. And then the second half, there are options for those who don't want to go to college. And so that was how that book got born and saved. So do you, do you, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is that you experience something or you learn something um, and it seems like you then want to put it into words that could be helpful to others. Is that in essence how the, the books that you've written have come about? I'll say nine out of 10. Probably okay. there's only one book which I don't talk about because it, it's a spoiler if I do talk about it. Okay. But it's the only book that is 100% pure entertainment. There's no message in it. Is there? No, not really. There's no message. Um, well, if there was a message, um, be careful what you do to people because it'll happen back to you. That would be the message. But it's really pure entertainment. So is it? Is it fiction? It is. Okay. It is. Okay. It's a horror fiction. But all my other books are like something happens, an experience happens, and I then write from that experience. Awesome. Well, I, I think it's, I think it's amazing when, I mean, it's not that anybody has the same life experience, of course, right. but when somebody can share what their life experience has been, it, it, like you said, it could be really helpful if you'd known this, you know, if you'd had access to this information, if, you know, and especially as a, as an adolescent, making a decision, a life-changing decision, like whether to go to college, where to go to college, what to study in college. I mean, these are all decisions that could potentially have very big implications on your life. And yet you're expected to navigate those decisions when you're, you know, well, you start making those decisions probably when you're like 15, you know, yeah. and it's just, it's kind of absurd when you think about it, that we ask this of our children, you know? Um, okay. Well, so, Getting to four keys to success, one of the things that I noticed is that there's there's a lot of uh, theming in terms of four, uh, four score, moving forward. Right. Um, was there was there a specific reason why the number four was um, was so kind of um, woven throughout right. throughout that book? Um, no, I th it's either fate or coincidence. The um, okay. four score is fiction that has to do with a band with four members in it. Um, 
moving forward is my memoir. It starts at the age of four. And then Four Keys, it's, I wasn't even, I had no intentions of writing this book actually. Um, it, it started out with me doing a workshop at church and someone said, you should turn this into a book. And I originally said I can't because I was, when I do workshops, I like to demonstrate because we learn better when we're up in, you know, doing something. Um, so I demonstrate and I, at the time I couldn't see how people could learn from it because they you can't really do a demonstration while you're reading a book. So I was like, hmm, probably not. But over time, more information and knowledge came to me about the specific topic that I do. Because it's basically four keys to um, success really has to do with identity. And most times we fail because we're trying to be either what our parents told us we need to be, um, what the school system told, me, told us we are, or sometimes a church, your religion tells you there's certain things you can and can't do, you are. Or sometimes our friends, you know, we... Um, are afraid to, how do I say, when we're in school, to not fit in. So we'll be what they want us to be, what they, you know, we'll listen to the music they want us, they like, because we want to fit in. Mm -hmm. So during that time, we kind of lose ourselves. And we're not who we really are, because we've become everything everyone else told us we were supposed to be or want us to be. And so during that time, I've realized there were certain things about us that actually make us who we are who make us unique. And in the process, I actually did a webinar. It just so happened to be four keys. It wasn't something I planned. It just happened to be that way. And once the webinar was over, I said, okay, I think I can put it in a book now because I was able to, even though I think the demonstration is better, I was still able to put it in a sense where people can understand where the, what I was trying to tell them as far as finding your identity and finding out who you are and um, how you use your identity to be successful. So it sounds like, you know, you, you have other means of, of presenting information besides writing books, right? You've, right. you've done other types of training and speaking. Um, do those things, do those activities give you basically the the content and the ideas that then eventually turns into a book or does it sometimes go the other way where you've written the book and then you end up then speaking and training about what's in the book does it is there a particular pattern of how all that stuff comes together not for me this was actually my first time turning a webinar into a book okay on my other books i just they they came they started out as a book um but no, I don't really have, none of my books, I always say my books are like children. They each have their own conception story. Um, that's they, a great I, way to put it. Yeah, I'm, that's basically what it is. I mean, I don't know anyone who could say all their children were conceived the exact same way, but none of them were conceived the exact same way. Each one had its own story as to how I thought of writing it. Okay. Well, I do think there's something to that four, though. I don't. They may not be evident at this time, but I, there's something with the four. So I, that may be uh, that may be something to think about going for, forward. Um, so tell me a little bit about the the speaking that you do, and is that is that something that you you do with a particular purpose? In other words, does it is it is it to promote the books or is it just another way that you share that information in a different format? Um, you know, I noticed on your website that, you know, you invite people to, uh, you know, to, to hire you to speak at events. Um, tell me a little bit about how the speaking uh, mixes in with your writing. Cause you've written a lot. So how do you, how do you put the two together? Well, that's barely, that's, um, let's, let me think. Actually, I think 2019, maybe the end of 2019 is when I actually started, um, the thing where I say you can invite me to speak. That's okay. pretty much new. That was and then the, And then we had the pandemic. So perfect yeah, timing. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, but I, I can still do um, online if people yeah. are, you know, but that was done because, so it actually goes back to the, the, the college book because one of the things I did learn in college was that not everything you learn is true. And the just to give you a short history so when i was in school you know they teach you bcs before christ was born ad is after he died 
And I remember, I don't remember what grade I was in, but the first time I heard it, the question I had is, so BC is before he was born and AD is after he died. What do you call the time period after he was born, but before he died? Right. And, but by that time, you know, cause prior to that, I was one of those children who just spoke his mind. Didn't, you know, I didn't know any, you know, innocent, but I got reprimanded in school a lot for that. Mm-hmm. So definitely by fourth, fifth grade, I just learned to shut up because I was tired of getting in trouble. So when that question came to my mind, I wanted to ask the teacher, but I was afraid. And so from elementary, middle to high school, I would always ask the question in my mind, but I never asked the teacher. Once I got to college and they told me AD means um, Anno Domini. And the funny thing was, I was like dozing off, I'm not even gonna lie in class. But when she mentioned it, it woke me up quickly. And I was like, wait, what? And I literally raised my hand and said, excuse me, what did you just say? And in that moment, I realized, okay, so everything you learned is not true. So from then on there, everything I learned, I researched it. And I began to realize you shouldn't really listen to people because of their title or how many letters they have to end their name. You should mm-hmm. listen to people according to their experience or their results, basically their results. And so, for instance, if someone tells me they have a doctor degree and make um, planting orange trees, but I come to their farm and they have absolutely no orange trees, and then someone tells me they dropped out of kindergarten, but they have 10,000 orange trees in their yard, yes, you have a degree, but you don't have the proof that you know what you're doing. Right. And so because of that, a lot of the things I was taught, I didn't see results from it. So I began to question it and I began to research and I began to figure out certain things. And when, and immediate, originally when I would find things out, I was like, oh, okay, and I would keep it to myself. And the first thing that actually started, funny enough, was I became, from 2010 to 2012, I was a stand-up comedian in New York and New Jersey because when I found something like weird that I didn't understand, I would share it with people at church straight, like seriously, and they would be laughing. And I would be like, I wasn't, that wasn't supposed to be a joke. I was like, (laughs) I was really pointing, I was trying to point, because for me, I didn't get straight A's. So when I noticed something, I thought maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm, so I would share it just to hear if people, but they would be laughing and I would be like, I wasn't trying to make a joke. I was trying to point something out. And so I did stand up comedy for three years. And then from there, I was like, but when people would ask me, wow, I never thought of that. Oh yeah, that's right. That's when I began to think, okay, so then I'm not the only one who realizes a lot of the stuff we were taught just doesn't make sense. And so that's when in 2019, I started the hire me to do workshop because it's a lot of information that we don't, we just do it because we're told to do it. And, right. um, you know, in church, if you question the pastor, you're going to hell. Parents, if you question us, we're whipping you. School, if you question a teacher, you go into the principal's office. So we're constantly taught you're not supposed to ask questions. You know, just whatever they tell you, believe it, and that's it. And so we, we become afraid to do, to, we just do stuff, and we never stop and ask, wait, why am I doing this? And so my workshops basically show people, this is why you're doing it, but this is what you should be doing instead, because this is actually what has the results that you want. And so that's how that workshop thing was birthed, was okay. me just figuring things out and then sharing it with people just to see if they saw the same thing I saw. Yeah. That's how that happens. Well, the, the progression, you know, sometimes when you look back on, on how you've wound up where you are and the steps you've taken along the way, you know, they don't necessarily make any sense at the time. Um, in fact, you may even be questioning at the time, like, what is this about? But then you kind of look back and you see the patterns or you see the things that connect to each other. And, you know, when you were talking about being so inquisitive as a child, I think, I think we all have that kind of inner four-year-old in us that wants to ask why incessantly, as kids do, you know, and even as a parent, it can, it can become a nuisance when your child just will not stop asking why, you know, cause you give them an answer and they want to go deeper and you give them another answer and they want to go deeper. Um, and then, you know, a parent is inclined to just say, well, just because, or because I told you, or, you know, it is that way just because it is. Right. And, and so we, that does kind of get 
um, taken away from us a little bit because you know it becomes disruptive in the classroom or you become that person in a meeting at work that everybody rolls their eyes when you start asking questions because hey we just want to get out of this meeting and get back to work stop asking questions but the interesting thing about comedians I think is that they do observe and ask questions about the world around them and then they simply find a really interesting way with their language to present that to an audience that everybody in that audience can generally relate to exactly what they're talking about. It's like they're bringing up the things that we all see and experience all the time, but we're not the ones asking why. The comics are the ones that are asking why. And so it actually becomes funny, right? Because not only because of their delivery, but just because you're sitting there in the audience thinking, yeah, why is that? Like that, that's actually like, that's a crazy thing that I, that we all see every day and I never even thought about it that way. And so it, it makes total sense to me that that, that inner four-year-old that, uh, that you still carry with you has manifested in different ways. <laughs> so I don't know how much detail you want to get into the keys um, or if you'd prefer that people discover them for themselves. But I was curious if of the four keys to success, you know, if somebody, if somebody hired you to come talk about that book and make it in a presentation format, right? Like, like give us a presentation about the four keys, but you know, you've only got five minutes cause the other speaker took too much time. So, you know, what's one nugget or what's your favorite key or what's the key that you think is the most impactful. In other words, if you had to take, um, knowing everything that you know about what's in that book and then just give somebody a nugget, what what do you think top of top of mind would be a significant thing that you would want people to know about that those keys specifically or the book as a total um i would tell them about the first key because you can't the keys two three and four can't be used until you know key one and the first key is finding your identity through um your attributes and there are five attributes about us that make us unique even if you are identical twin, triplet, whatever the case may be, there's five attributes that no one shares. And obviously the first two we already know, your um, hand prints and your feet prints. But keys, um, the other three most people don't even know, the third one is your ear prints is unique. And um, it's been used by detectives and police to figure out who's been at a scene. If you ever press your ear against something, a window, they can prove you were the one who did it. Um, I did not know that. Yes. I've never, I've never seen that on CSI. So <laughs> that's how I found out. Actually, oh, I you? found out through an Instagram post, but then I saw, I think, um, what was it called on, um, Amazon prime silent witness. There was a ear print on the window and he wasn't guilty, but he was a, uh, a witness, so to speak. So they were able okay. to prove he, he was, was the there. Man. They could prove he was there. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the fourth one would be your mouth. We know that your teeth, when you die, they can use your dental records to prove it's you. But also your lips and your tongues have their own print as well, that's unique. So if you, I say ladies, if you use your lips, if you have lipstick on and you drink out of a cup, they can prove you were the one who drank from it because of mm -hmm. the print. And then the last thing are your irises and your eyes. Those are unique as well. And so to put that all in together, your path, or the universe knows who you are according to those five attributes. So if you are not on your correct path or you're not touching what should be yours, you're not um, listening because lots of times we, well, everyone else is doing that, but yeah, what you heard, the because um, a lot of times people talk about, oh, I heard something tell me to do such and such. Yeah, that was specifically to you because that voice knew your ear print. So they knew that that was supposed to go to you. Um, and I call it the Holy Spirit, but I know not everyone is, you know, into that, but, and then of course your mouth. Lots of times we, even now, when you see all this protesting, a lot of people may not agree with certain things or they agree differently, but because people who look like them agree a certain way, they'll speak what they hear as opposed to what they want to speak because they're afraid of, you know, losing friends or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And then your irises, when we see, when we have visions of something or, or an idea we want to do, lots of times we share it with someone who doesn't have that same vision and they'll tell you that's a dumb idea, don't even think about it. And unfortunately, most people go, yeah, you're right. And then they, 
they, tr they go back to work or they go back to doing what was comfortable instead of using that vision to put, propel them into their success. And so the first key, I say you have to learn how to be you. A, um, without shame that you're different and B, without condemnation that someone else is different. And the easiest way to explain that is penguins don't explain to eagles why they're not flying and eagles don't explain to penguins why they're not swimming. They're still birds but they don't have to try to change to be like the other one. And they also don't criticize the other one because they're not like them. And so we have to learn how to be who we are, but still not criticize other people because they don't see the things we see or they don't um, dress the way we dress or whatever the case may be. Be proud to be you, but also don't diminish other people because they're not you. And so that was, that's the first key that I teach yeah. on the five attributes that make you you. And that's how you become successful by following those five attributes. Well, that definitely sounds very foundational, you know, like that's, that's where you have to start this whole discussion of the keys, the keys to success. The, the eagle peg, penguin uh, statement that you just made, was that, is that something that, that you thought of or had you heard that somewhere? No, I thought of it because I, I, where I live now, I lived here for 15 years. Um, my sister and I, well, she always remembers it because we moved here when she had her first child. So however old her child is, lets us know how long we've been here. It's a place where there are massive species of birds that I didn't even know existed mm. at all. And every time I see a different one, I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck is that? Especially when I've heard of buzzards and hawks and things like that. But to see them close up, they're, to me, they're cute, but they're also scary because they just stand there looking at you like, what do you want from me? Like, they're not afraid like the little birds. So I just begin to see all these different birds and I begin to notice that no matter how different they are, they're still birds. Right. And they don't try to, you know, the, the dove never goes, well, the swan is white. So maybe I should try to get as big as a swan and learn how to swim because if I'm going to be white like a swan, then I, I have to be like it. You know, they're all proud of who they are, but they're also not, you know, criticizing each other because they're different right. and, and noticing I mean, and even doing research, there's, what is it called? A kiwi bird, I think it's called. It looks like a, a mouse with a beak. And it has no feathers, it just has fur. And it looks like a mouse, um, a little fur ball with a beak. But it's still a bird, you know? It's not any less because it doesn't fly and it doesn't have feathers and it doesn't have wings. It's still a bird. And when we look at animals, we don't, make fun of them because they're different from one another. But with us, we want to, because someone's different, there's so much arguing. So it's just frustrating to see all of this, this hatred going on because basically yeah. no one wants to be happy with how they are. They, they want to see someone else. I mean, when I think about when, um, or they want other people to be like them. Either, or it's just, I don't get it because they're one of the things I said, um, because they were making a big deal about, um, what's her name? The one who just got um, nominated for vice president. Oh, Kamala Harris? Yes, and they were saying, well, do we call her black or do we call her African-American? And I'm like, well, when you're with your children and you see a bird, most times you just say, look at the little birdie. Right. You see doggies, oh, look at the little doggy. You never mention the color. You, most times you, well, I don't because I have no, clue i think i know what a poodle looks like and that's it but the rest of the dogs i couldn't tell you what they were but not everyone says the name of the species of dog when they see it same thing with cats no one looks we just call it birds cats and dogs and so i'm trying to figure out why can't we just call each other humans like why do we have to break down everything else but i believe it's because in school we're taught not by teachers but i guess I'll say lunch tables is how we learn how to be in a group of people. And those are the cheerleaders. Those are the football players. Those are the geeks. Those are, you know, the F students. Those are the, the, the bad students, you know, and we put ourselves in groups and we never learn how to be individuals. So by the time we leave school, we don't know how to be individuals. And so we're trying to understand First, when we see someone different, why am I different? 
you know, like, why don't I have that hair? Why don't I have that height? Why don't I have that weight? Why don't I have that skin color? And then instead of saying, because I don't need it, like, you know, the crow doesn't need to be read like a cardinal. So instead, I, I truly believe we get insecure in ourselves and we become miserable. And as we know, misery loves company. So if I don't like my weight, then I'm going to talk about your weight because you remind me whatever it may be when I see you, you remind me I don't like my weight. So I'm going to make you feel as miserable as me. Um, I don't like my hair. When I see your hair, you remind me of that. I'm going to make you miserable, make you think there's something wrong with your hair. And I truly believe that's why we go back and forth at each other because we're not proud of who we are in the midst of seeing everyone else. I did see a, um, a picture. Um, it was a, what was it? A flamingo and a peacock. And it said something to the, the fact that the, the, the flamingo is not as less as beautiful as a peacock because those are, most people consider them beautiful birds, but no one ever says, well, a peacock is better than a, you know, right. but with humans, we do that. And it's like, why can't we all be beautiful in our unique way as a flamingo is unique to a peacock, but they're still birds and they're still beautiful. Why do we have to compare? And so the, the purpose of identity is first being who you are and being proud of it and then not criticizing other people. And when you get to the point, because I truly believe when you read the four keys, you can't just read it. You have to stop. Once you finish reading key one, you need to stop and deal right. with that and deal with why do you feel the need to criticize everything? Because on social media, it doesn't matter if something wonderful happens, someone will find the, the criticism that needs to take sure. place. Sure, sure. And it's like, why can't we just, there's nothing. And I know nothing can be perfect, but sometimes it's just like, can you stop critic? Is there anything you, you, you know? So the first step is why are you always criticizing? Because some people do it all the time. Like they, they, they're not happy until they're finding criticism. And so the first step is to why are you always criticizing? And when you deal with that and you deal with being happy, being you, and you're not upset with everyone else, then you can move on to key two, three, and four, which all have to do with being unique. Well, and, and it sounds like, I mean, just working with key one could be, an, could be enough. Right. I mean, it, it could be it could be transformative. Right. We talked about, you know, I went on this journey to seek transformation. Um, just working with that first key, I think, could be transformative. And in your in your talking about it, you actually answered or at least spoke a little bit to the final question that I had for you, which is because you have this, um, I think, a very interesting way of expressing ideas. You know, they're they're unique to you. Um, but you're, you're speaking about in writing about what may be considered a universal theme or a universal idea, but yet you have a very interesting way of saying it. And I noticed in when I looked at some of the Amazon reviews and, you know, what people are saying about your work. And I noticed that that's what resonated with some people that, that I love how you, you know, I love how Casey talked about this, but there's that other side, which is that, especially when you do things in a more unique way, there's always a critic right? There's always somebody that, you know, so how, you know, maybe the final question, if, if you have time to answer it is, how do you personally um, handle, whether it be the inner critic or an external critic who's, you know, kind of poking holes at your ideas? Well, there's two things. The first thing is sometimes you don't always have to respond. Um, lots of times people either are raised a certain way or they they criticize for the purpose of an argument because they're so used to arguing, they need to argue. And so they'll say something purposely for the argument. But if you don't say anything, they can't argue because there's, you know, there's nobody speaking back. So sometimes, and I remember, what was it? Eighth grade math, I think it was. There was a sign that said something about ignorance is, um, something about ignoring ignorance. And it was some type of statement that basically said you're, you're better off ignoring it, but it's difficult because mm -hmm. we see the need to lash back. And sometimes the best thing to do is to shut up, like mm -hmm. let them say it. And the one thing you can never do is have an argument when someone agrees with you. You know, if I say today's Tuesday, no one's gonna argue with me because that's what it is. But 
if I, someone now, if I say today's Wednesday, I now have an argument. But if someone says something, like criticizes, like in some of the criticism, I remember someone, um, someone actually um, made a, a criticism about one of my books on Amazon. And I have no clue, I guess she, she put it on Twitter. And somehow her, her followers saw it and one of them emailed me and told on her. And I was like, first of all, cause she was like, oh, this person said bad about your book. And my first thing was, well, not everyone's gonna like it. Like, I don't right. care. But she thought the need to tell on her. And I actually responded to the actual reviewer and I said, people are telling on me, but I want you to know, I don't mind. I'm okay with it because I understand that that's, and to be, how do I say, some of my books, the message is great, but the writing is not that great. But because I know that if I, someone says something, I'm not going to be offended because right. I know that. Now right. I can argue back and forth with the person, but at the end of the day, I'll say, you know what? You're right. That's true. I agree. So now they can't argue. And so sometimes it's best just to be quiet or to agree. The other thing is sometimes they are wrong, but you have to understand, like I said, they, when they see you, that you are a reminder to them about what they lack. So if, like I remember seeing on the news, this father, his son was being bullied in school. And so finally he, he asked his son, who is it? And he said, well, it's mainly one person. So he went to the boy and said, why are you messing with my son? And he finally just told him because he has nice shoes and my mom's not able to afford. So that's why he was bullying him. It had nothing to do with him as a person. It was just that that boy was reminding him of how poor his family was. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to bully that boy into feeling the same pain he felt. So what did his, the dad do? He took the boy to the shoe store and bought him some shoes. Outstanding. And that's yeah. what caused them. Now these two boys are friends. And so most times when people do that is you are a reminder to them of what they want or don't or ha want, but don't have what they believe. Cause sometimes people see you and they think you're a billionaire and all you have are two pennies in your bank account. But sometimes they see more than in you than you actually are. So now they're trying to bully you because you, for whatever reason, are reminded to them of who they're not. Well, so and I know for myself, I'm often the most critical, you know, when I'm, when I'm, and I, I try not to judge, but that, that's, that's a hard one. Um, when I'm critical of others, it's often for the things that actually, honestly, I dislike about myself. And I, you know, it's easier for me to, to criticize someone else than to criticize myself. So it's like, it's almost as if they're a mirror reflecting back what I don't like in myself and it makes me angry. And I, and I, you know, I externalize that. So yeah, we could go on. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic, but. Um. Well, that is all the time we have today for today's episode, Writer Writer Interviews. I am your host, Casey Bell. Please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we hope to see you again next week for another episode of Writer to Writer Interviews. So, I don't know if I should ask this. Yeah, I'll ask it now. So you kind of already mentioned it, but what was your, your, your walk and your journey through publishing? Because you've obviously had no intentions of writing, so you've never experienced right. publishing. So what were some of the things you learned in the process? Um, well, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, I mean, I, I, I find writing to be, uh, well, I, I don't want to say that it's hard because actually I, I think I've always kind of, uh, enjoyed writing, but it is time consuming for me. Um, and of course I made probably a lot of the mistakes that, you know, a lot of rookie writers make in terms of, you know, I was editing along the way instead of just kind of getting everything out there and then worrying about the editing later. I and mean, there's all kinds of, you know, quote rules that, that experienced authors would tell you are the, the best way to do it. I ultimately think everybody has their own, yeah. their own way. Right. But, um, it was, it was, it, it probably took months. Um, you know, my wife would probably be able to say, you know, yeah, you came back and then like you were gone again, you know, for a long period of time because I was just so focused and now I'm back to working. Right. So now I'm, I'm working, which involves a lot of traveling. I'm not home 50% of the time. And whenever I was home, I was on the couch with my laptop 
you know, working on this manuscript. And so it was definitely more time consuming and probably more, um, took more effort than I had anticipated, but it was really, it was really a joy to do it. Um, and then all the decisions that had to be made about, okay, even though I think I write pretty well, I know I should have an editor, you know, I should have someone take a look at this and, and clean it up a little bit or make it, have it say, you know, say something in a way that's more, you know, interesting than the way that I said it. Um, so finding an editor and then deciding, you know, of all the people and companies out there that can help you with things like cover design and interior layout and you know do I want to just do that myself do I want to hire people to do that how much money do I want to spend ultimately um, I didn't write the book with the intention of it being a money maker in fact I actually it says right on the book all the profits from the book sales go to charities that support the Camino so anything that you know once I cover the cost of producing the book, then everything that's over that, I, I send to charities that, that maintain the trails and help the hostels. And it just didn't feel right to me that I should take this experience that, you know, was so profound and then like make money off of talking about it. <laughs> so, um, so it never, it never was like, oh, I'm going to make money from, from writing this book. But you still, there's a financial investment involved, you know, especially if you're hiring people to do things and, and it co costs money. And so navigating all those decisions, ultimately deciding what type of publishing and uh, how much did I want to control versus how much was I going to let other people control. Um, all of that as a first timer was, was kind of intimidating. And um, I didn't really have anybody to hold my hand through that process. I kind of just figured it out on my own. So the next book, and there will be another book. I haven't, I haven't focused yet on what's next, but I know there'll be another book. Um, I'll probably do a lot of things differently uh, just based on what I learned the first time around. So did that answer the question or were you looking for something more specific? That was fine. Okay. Um, so you said this is in Spain, right? Yes. So for those watching saying, oh, this sounds like fun, but I can't speak Spanish. How did you overcome that barrier? Yeah. So, you know, I, I took some Spanish in high school. That's a long time ago. Um, I had too much confidence, I think, in my Spanish, which is very limited. And it's not even conversational. Um, but as a lot of times Americans, and I've traveled abroad many times, not to Spain, but to other countries. And a, and a lot of times I think Americans tend to think that, well, everywhere I go, people will speak English. Um, you know, along the Camino in Northern Spain, there's not a lot of English speaking. You know, the people that run the hostels, um, they probably know more English than, than the, than just the local residents do. But I would, I would say it's not imperative. Um, you can certainly get by. I would, I would always, if you visit a foreign country, learn basic, um, you know, thank Hello, you, goodbye. please, How excuse you? me, you know, just kind of the social graces, you know, just so that you're, you're making an attempt. Um, but I think, and it's one of the things that I mention as a suggestion at the end of my book, you know, for those considering it, what would I, what would I recommend or do differently? I'd, I'd have a better handle on Spanish because I think it would have enriched the experience. There were times when I could have had conversations with local people that I didn't have because the language barrier was too great. And had I been able to have those conversations, it could have, it could have really enriched the experience even more so. So it's not necessary. You can get by without really knowing much Spanish, but, um, but I think it's a plus if you know a little bit and can converse with people a little bit. All right, last question. So when you, before you left, everyone was like, why are you doing this? Have they seen the purpose now as far as have they seen the change in you? Have they acknowledged that to you? That's really interesting. I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you know, if there's one thing that I do consistent, consistently in my own eyes is I let myself down, meaning I'm not always the person that I want to be, you know, I don't always behave in the ways that I, I want to behave or that I, I tell myself I should behave in those ways. And so um, I do think coming back home, I immediately, I mean, there was no, um, there was no like soft landing. 
I immediately came back into, you know, work the next day. You can imagine a month away from work with the email inbox looks like, oh. um, we were actually moving uh, during this time. So we are, we're, we're trying to sell a house. We're, we're moving into a house. Um, it was pure kind of chaos. Uh, my, my, my father-in-law had actually passed away while I was in Spain. Oh, so God. we've got a memorial that I'm giving the eulogy for, you know, I mean, it's just like life, right? Life. And so it, it felt like in the early months after I returned, it felt like, everything that I had gained had fallen away. Wow. It, it felt, it felt to me like all these insights, all these, you know, th th uh, these thoughts that I had about how I was going to be when I got it, it. It's like it had all disappeared. Like the whole thing had never happened. And what changed that was writing the book because it did take me a few months after I was back before I literally started writing. I mean, I wanted to do it right away, but time got away from me. So um, as I was writing the book, then I was re-remembering and reliving the experience. And it was kind of challenging me to want to wait a minute, like, you know, the last couple of months, I haven't actually been living this idea that I'm talking about in my book. And, um, and then as a speaker, eventually I started speaking about my experience. And so I started talking to groups about my experience and, and that, you know, when you, when you write it, when you talk about it, it kind of makes you more accountable to walk your talk, so to speak. So I don't know what others would say, honestly. I don't know that anybody, you know, has told me that they see a difference or, they, you know, I don't, I don't know that I've gotten that feedback. But I think I went from, you know, kind of coming back on, you know, this cloud nine, you know, life is amazing to suddenly plunging back down onto the earth with all of its, you know, craziness and chaos to then finding some sort of a middle ground. And that's, that's where I try to live now. I can't, I can't duplicate being on the Camino in my normal life. Right. But I can try to remember what it was like and, and take those lessons that I learned and incorporate them into my life and try to be that better person that was, you know, my intention was to be a better, better, better human being when I got back. And so I consider that to be a lifelong project. Like that's never done, you know, I'm never, I'm never satisfied. I, I'm always thinking, oh, you know, I should have done that differently, could have done that better, shouldn't have, you know, lashed out at that person. Um, so it's a work in progress, but, but I'm definitely the, the writing of the book uh, kind of brought it all back, which was really good. Because had I not written the book, honestly, six months after I got back, I might have lost all of it. I might have lost all the gain of that experience. And what a shame that would have been, right? To, to leave your family for a month and, and go experience this thing. And then six months or a year later, it's like it never happened. I, I, I would, oh, that would just be so hard to take. So I'm so thankful that I wrote the book because it, uh, it really kind of brought it all back to me. I will say, which I was supposed to say this at the beginning, I do like the title the way you wrote it, um, the souls. That actually came to me on the Camino, even though I wasn't thinking about a book. Right. It was actually, I probably was thinking about it more in terms of like the title of a speech, right? Because that's what I do for a living. Um, but I decided ultimately that that would be the title for the book, especially since it came to me on the Camino. I thought, well, I have to listen to that. I have, I have to go with that because that's what, that's what came to me. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. The whole thing's been fun. The, the book creation part, uh, the creativity, the putting all that stuff together is, uh, it's hard, but it's a lot of fun. Would you consider doing it again with your wife? Um, if I could do it with her. Yeah, I would not want to leave again for a month, uh, to leave her for a month. Um, I just, I felt like that was an incredibly, on one hand, it's an incredibly selfish thing to do. Um, I mean, I could have had all the you know, wonderful altruistic reasons in the world to do it. But at the end of the day, you know, I left for a month and she had no idea who was going to come back. You know, she, <laughs> she drops me off at the airport and we're going to talk maybe once a week. And we're going to, we're going to text probably every day at the end of every day, I texted my family, but we only, I only spoke to my wife about once a week. So I'm going to be gone for a month. We're only going to talk once a week. And who's this guy going to be when he comes back? 
you know, she, she didn't know. I didn't know. I mean, I was positive. I was optimistic. I'm going to be better, but who knows, right? Who knows how a person comes back from something like this? So I don't know that I would want to do that or ask that she kind of go through that again. But if she wanted to go, I'd be happy to tag along.